Um, I am probably most excited about our next speaker, and, and here's why. You know, I remember when I, after Dylan's four brain surgeries and after Dr. Spetzler saved his life, I kept thinking, I wonder who his hero is, because everybody looks up to this person. He is the idol of so many. Who does he look up to? And the answer actually came, this came out a few years ago, one of the Barrow magazines. It was the 50th anniversary issue, and in it, he answers that question. And it is his brother, Bertram Spetzler. And I read a little bit about Bertram, and I, I asked Dr. Spetzler a little bit about Bertram then, and it is truly remarkable. A life-changing event changed his life and his family's life forever, and the courage and the honor with which he has handled it so inspired Dr. Spetzler that when you ask him, who do you look up to, who's your hero, it's our next speaker. I'm so excited to meet Bertram, and now you all get that opportunity. For those of you who haven't met him, please welcome. Dr. Bertram Spetzler, an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Virginia Tech, Cary Lyon Institute. What a pleasure. Nice to meet you. I have to go off script for just a second. Nan, you re redeemed yourself for Wednesday night. <laughs> and you needed to. Volker, you're the honorary seventh sibling in our family. You've had 34 years, but don't forget I've known him all my life. Well, I'm honored, Robert and Nancy, that you asked me to represent the siblings at this intimate retirement party before 800 of your closest friends. Well, it's obvious now that Robert, in his maturity, has become quite comfortable in his own skin. How else could he allow his younger, better looking, more athletic, and probably brighter brother to speak? <laughs> I expected even more laughs than that. I did hear a few chuckles, and that was supposed to be a laugh line, as anyone would know, who grew up in a family of six siblings. Naturally, there was sibling rivalry but we were showered with the fortune of having parents that guide us to expend our energy in useful and creative ways. Robert, of all of us, has really accomplished that. The real beauty of growing up in a family of six siblings is that at this stage and for the last 50 plus years, we've respected, loved, and supported each other. Before I give you a couple of anecdotes about how Robert developed his early love of surgery, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge what others have already acknowledged, but it's so obvious to all of us, and most all of you that know him well, that no one accomplishes what Robert has accomplished in isolation. Without Nancy, with her grace, intelligence, sense of humor, and may I add beauty at his side, he would have been limited. What is able One is able to perform well and be creative when there's a home that one is always eager to return to. Having a base of loving energy, free of conflict, and a creative participating partner is invaluable. Nancy, this lady who qualified and completed the Boston Marathon, was at Robert's side when he scaled 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado and Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa at over 19,000 feet. Theirs is a true partnership that helps support each other's success. Now, you've heard a lot about other things that Robert has done, but I can tell you some of the childhood things. Because the earliest memory that I have of Robert's technical skill was when he dissected out the balancing ring in the shark's head. It's a mechanism by which the shark is able to maintain the correct orientation in the water. It's a circular tube a few millimeters wide, fragile, and had not been accomplished by the other students in his comparative anatomy class. At least that's what he told me. <laughs> I was able to see it, though, in one of the workbenches in our basement, and I, a high school student, was quite impressed with the controlled dexterity that, that was required to accomplish that feat. 
Our first house back in the 1950s in Illinois had a coal-fired furnace, a basement in three sections. It wasn't finished, it had open rafters. Two sections had cement floors and the third still had dirt. In the furnace room, we had a workbench and a place for some of our creative energy. After the impressive shark dissection, I remember that we received two hamsters. They were kept in a cage, but one, as these animals tend to do, had a high degree of testosterone level. And soon they became multiple, and we required a lot more cages. Now remember, this was a different era in the 60s, and I don't want to step on anybody's sensitivities. But Robert was able to get some anesthetic and some surgical tools, probably from the anatomy lab, and I, I was able to assist him when he did exploratory abdominal surgery. <laughs> it was actually able to count the number of the next batch of hamsters to be born. <laughs> Having finished the exploration, the hamster was carefully sewn back up and surprisingly did not get an infection and later had her normal litter. Quite astounding for a freshman college student. At Knox College, he already dissected the circle of Willis, which is the intricate circulation of the brain. By the time he was a second year medical student, I was a freshman in a biology lab running white rats through an experimental maze and timing them. After establishing a baseline time for the four rats, I took them to Chicago, approximately 100 miles away to visit Robert at Northwestern Medical School. Again, I don't know how he had access to a surgical lab, <laughs> tools, and anesthetic. I certainly couldn't have helped my sibling in that same way. But in any case, he probably performed his first neurosurgical procedures, doing sham incisions on two and frontal lobotomies on the others. Afterwards, I took them back home to rerun the maze. So naturally, I take credit for giving him his start in neurosurgery. <laughs> now, I do need to finish the story about the hamsters rather quickly. The multiplication of the hamsters was solved in a rather unfortunate manner. Robert, ever the adventurous soul, brought home four cub foxes. This is a true story which were then isolated in the third segment of the basement with a board and a cardboard barricade. I have to go off script, you know, nowadays he would just assign somebody that task, but that's what he was doing himself, didn't have all the nurses running after him. <laughs> well, I don't remember whether it was the first night that they were at our home or the third, but somehow those wily cubs broke out of their, enclo out of their enclosure, leading to the end of the hamster cages. My mother, for months afterwards, would occasionally find hamster nests in various nooks and crannies. An angel, our mother was. The story should end there, but in corralling the foxes, before taking them back to the farm, one of them bit him. That required a consultation, a series of 21 rabies shots into the abdomen. Naturally, our budding hero, Robert, gave himself all those shots developing empathy for his future patients. <laughs> I need to wrap this up. Nancy told me to keep it short, but there's so much material from which to pull stories. Let me just talk about Robert as a complete person. Our father, who had a very classical European education, which included learning by the Greeks and Romans, would talk about the Greek ideal of mind, body, and spirit. Robert is a complete package. You're all obviously familiar with his creative, inquisitive mind. It isn't, though, just about neurosurgery. He likes to engage on multiple topics. I like the anecdote he once told me that when he makes rounds with his residents, he doesn't just tick, stick to neurosurgical questions, but will pepper them with questions about music, literature, or current events. Now, can you imagine? being with a renowned chief neurosurgeon on rounds as a young resident. Already being nervous, wanting to make a good impression, and then being thrown curveballs. The point I believe he was making is that to be complete and to be a good surgeon, your focus needs to be broadened. You can't understand and empathize with your patients 
unless your horizon is widened. Robert can communicate with patients from diverse, diverse walks of life because he does have that broad horizon. As to the body, not only does he have gifted hands, but his physical exploits are legend. It actually goes back all the way to high school. Unbelievably, he's an untrained freshman swimmer. His first multi-school meet, he came in third in his event. Quite the boastful accomplishment, until our father broke the spell and asked him how many participants there were. <laughs> yeah, you got the answer. It was three. <laughs> Another true story, Robert, right? But his commitment to physical fitness is real. I don't know of any other residency program that at one time had a neurosurgical Olympics competition between faculty and residents from another university. His annual hike across the Grand Canyon from the south rim to the north or in reverse, a short walk of 24 miles has become an annual rite of passage. I don't know if it's been 33 or 34 consecutive years now that this beautiful hike through the canyon has been completed, but it includes the last 10 hikes labeled, and this is the last time. It's actually a couple of t-shirts that memorialize that. Incidentally, the residents, staff, Nancy and Robert will be doing this again Sunday, but only with 96 of his closest friends. So much more to tell, but we have to stop at some point. As to spirit, there are many ways to look at this. His boundless energy, his ability to set examples for others, his generosity to family, and yes, his humility. I do have to comment on humility since for most people, they do not understand the word neurosurgeon and humility in the same sentence. You don't associate humility with someone who holds the essence of what it is to be human in their hands. But I've had numerous conversations with Robert about how do you keep perspective when sometimes others hold you up on a pedestal or when you tackle tasks successfully that others do not dare to do. His reply is quite simple. There's nothing like a patient to teach you your limits. He realizes and will be the first to admit that there's so much we do not know. And it's by the grace of God that we are able to push the frontiers. The other place where Robert is able to renew his perspective in the greater scheme of life is in the grandeur, both large and small, of nature. I remember reading a quote after we climbed Kilimanjaro Climbing a mountain peak does not change who you are, but it does change perspective and sense of place in the larger world. Robert, you've worked hard. You've accomplished much. You've been able to be a father and set a great example, and you have a good partner. You've been a good partner to Nancy. Your hands have helped thousands. You've influenced many more to do the same. Quite a testament to life being well lived. Let me finish with a quote that's written on a decorative stone on my front door in Southwest Virginia that says this, life is not measured by how many breaths you take, but by how many moments in life take your breath away. Robert, you've been alert to those moments, you've cherished them, and even more so you've created them for others and yourself. Robert, I can say this for all your siblings, Hartmut, Carl, Herman, myself, and Gabriele, and our spouses and families. We love you, we're proud of you, and we thank you. That was wonderful. All right, somebody bring some tissues in here. We're going to need them. We're going to need them. Dr. Spetzler, thank you. Thank you for making the trip out here. He was my highlight because I, I, when I read his story and I read how much you admired him, I was so looking forward to seeing him in person. <laughs>